and welcome to The Jump. We have a massive night ahead. It is grand final series tonight. Game one, the Sydney Kings and the Tassie Jack Jumpers. And there's a little bit of extra excitement in the studio. Andrew Gaze and Leonard Copeland. Yes, there's a real buzz. And uh, the buzz is really being generated by the Tasmanian Jack Jumpers. It just... One of the great stories, if not the greatest story in not just basketball, in, in Australian Australia, sport yeah. over the last few years. I can't think of too many uh, bigger than the way in which the, a new franchise comes in and somehow or other they're in a championship series. Amazing. I got a question for you, though. Mm. If they get swept, is it still <laughs> an amazing story? It's, it is. Yeah. I think they're playing with the house's money right now. And mm. I think we saw that during the Melbourne United series. Nothing where to lose. That Melbourne United got very, very tight down no, the street. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> and then it was the Jack Jumpers who, who playing just free. And yeah. uh, no matter what happened in that series, that it was going to be a success. And again, in the Sydney series coming up, yeah, obviously there's a championship at stake and the players have this rare opportunity to, to, to win a title. But even if they lose, they're still walking away heroes. Do you give them a chance? You always, in a two-horse race, you always got to give them a chance. And the way they've been playing together, that coach has them rolling. Yeah. So, I, look, I'm going to say this. They'll win game two. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick they'll win game two. It's, oh, I can't see it. I, I'm predicting a sweep, but uh, I've... Riding, riding off the jack jumpers has proven to be a, a, a real bad, bad thing yep. to do. So I'm hoping for a competitive series, and I'd love to see it go the distance, and we want this thing to go on as long as it possibly can. But when you look at the talent that the Ooh. Sydney Kings are, are bringing to yep. the table, uh, it's going to be tough for the jack jumpers. Well, the Apple Isle is going off. The Sydney Kings probably flying under the radar, which is crazy to think. And Andrew Bogut, obviously Aussie legend, but one of the owners of the Sydney Kings is going to join us later on in the show. Do you reckon it helps Sydney, the fact that no one's really talking about them? They Sydney are the hot favourites. They don't need help. They, they, they don't got care. a lot of talent, man. Mm. They, 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 they're thick through and through. I just think um, the Jack Jumpers, you can't count them out. Mm. Give them game two, but Sydney will win the series. And, and there's something about the karma of it all as well. And right now, if you're not a Sydney Kings fan, every single other person in the nation is going to be on the Jack uh, I don't know about that. They want to see the... Fa oh, except for <laughs> Melbourne United fans who are just... <laughs> So we're still bitter but surely, and flat as a pancake. <laughs> surely, wow. Nat, you're still saying, would be thinking, well, if someone's going to win it, let's hope it's the Jack Jumpers because it would just make for this... This is 1980 Miracle on Ice type uh, sporting yeah. achievement that, that I think that they can achieve. Type thing, yeah, yeah, the underdog that, that we're Go all... Kings, I say. <laughs> that game wow. tipping off in about an hour's time, so stay with us. Let's get straight into it, though, because we've got a massive show. The Jump Starters to kick things off here. Presented by DoorDash, your delivery MVP, the official delivery partner of the NBL. And the big news this week in the NBL, apart from the grand final mm. series, is that Brian Gorgian has stepped yeah. down as coach of the Illawarra Hawks. He's going to stay on board as an advisory. Mm. Um, do you think he's headed overseas, though, Gazy? Well, who knows? I, I think that uh, the problem now for every other NBL coach is they get a little bit more nervous because it's kind of like in the AFL with the Alistair Clarkson when you've got this iconic figure that's won championships. It's almost a guarantee you're going to get to the playoff when Brian Gordon is your coach. They're going to be a little nervous because every other team would be seriously looking at it. Now, as I look through it, right now it's only the South East Melbourne Phoenix that have an opening, but they have indicated that they'd like to uh, re-sign Simon Mitchell. But when a guy like Brian Gorgian becomes yeah. available, you would be negligent yep. as a franchise not to consider and, and ask the question. So who knows what's going to happen. It's been a lot of time in, in uh, Asia, in particular in China. China yeah. So uh, there's a lot, a lot of money to be made in yeah, China. He's been there. He's done that. He's gotten older. His grandkids are in Melbourne, like you say. If I'm South East Melbourne, i got to have a look at him, see what he's thinking. And it's a perfect fit for him. Well, it's, it's going to be... A, I, I think that Simon Mitchell, though, got the greatest endorsement that he could ever want this week with Mitch Creek coming out. Their star player, a, a, a star player not just with the Phoenix, but with, uh, throughout the entire NBL, mm -hmm. with him coming out and saying, listen... If Simon's here, then I'm here. Yep. If he's not there, that's Ooh. not to say I won't be there, oh, but I just reserve the right to maybe reconsider well, my position. Well, if Brian Gorgian was there, surely you'd stay. Put it on the line right now. No fence sitting, either mm. of you. Mm -hmm. Gorge, does he coach next year? 
I think he coaches in Melbourne. I'm calling it. I'm getting off the fence. Get off the fence, Gazy. Gazy. I'm thinking, I'm saying right now, he's the National League, uh, league coach. If I can get him, I'm, I'm going after him. No, I don't see that because Phoenix have said all the right things about Simon Mitchell, and, and I think that... Uh, that was before Gordon became available. That is true, but but I think that, that they've gone down that path and uh, with Mitch Creek with so the endorsement... So, still sitting on the fence? No, I'm not. I'm saying that I don't no, think... he's not going to coach. I, not in the NBL, because okay. let's not forget, he's still the, the national coach. He's got those commitments yep. with the national team. Yep. Take a, a, Take a, a season, unless uh, some sort of real godfather offer comes from uh, perhaps overseas, then I think that he'd just be committed to the Boomers program. All right, well, there's good news for Perth Wildcats fan because Bryce Cotton has inked a new three-year deal. That'll make everyone very happy, in particular because for the first time they weren't in finals for the first time in 35 years, and he's so integral to them mm. getting back into the finals, isn't he, Coach? That was always going to happen, though. You've got to sign your best player and try to keep him for five years if you can. But you know what they got to do? they got to get a big man, Joy. Yeah. If they don't get a big man, I don't care if you got Bryce and Law, yeah. they need help rebounding that ball, blocking shots, playing good defense. Because as you've seen, the league's gotten better. And Cotton's still a fantastic player, one of the best players in the league, but he needs some help. Well, I, I, you're, but anytime you've got Vic Law and Bryce Cotton, you're starting from a really, really mm -hmm. good base. And th they'll look to tweak their team. Copes is right. They've got to try and field that middle position. But here's one for you, Copes. Go back to the old schoolyard, and you're the captain, and you've got to pick team. And, and, and on the wall here, you got Bryce Cotton and Jalen Adams. Have we? Mm. Well, who oh. are you picking first? I'm closing my eyes and going. <laughs> Not either one. Either, either <laughs> one, because they both gonna get you. Get off the fence, I'm man! Off the fence. I'm picking Jalen Adams oh. right now. <laughs> nah, Easy. Bryce Cotton for sure. Okay, I think history says you, we, you're still going with uh, Bryce Cotton because of all those rings and what he's been able to do. But uh, you, you're right. You're not disappointed That's if right. the consolation prize is Jalen Adams. <laughs> Definitely not. All right, that was the jump starters. Thanks, of course, to DoorDash, your delivery MVP. I want to switch our focus now to the NBA Conference semi-finals. The Warriors and the Grizz, well, they are locked at one all at the moment. It has been a brutal series so far. You had Ja Morant dropping 47 points with one good eye. You had Draymond Green flipping off the crowd. Chucked and then, out. of course, Dylan Brooks ejected three minutes into a game. Mm. He's also been suspended for game three. And this incident, oh. it was horrific mm. because Gary Payton the second, has a fractured elbow and is going to miss some time. It's just brutal, isn't it? Yeah, talking three to four weeks. And he's become, you know, he's a role player with with the Warriors, but a, as someone who just has been, uh, worked his way into an integral part of their lineup. And and that is, I feel sorry for Brooks. I don't Why think, do you feel sorry for well, Brooks? Well, I, I don't he think... He to. Yeah, I don't think oh his intent God. was to cause any Can harm. You? And it's just one where in that competitive environment... Oh, these guys are professionals. They yeah. know you can't go after a guy who's in the air... You just don't do well, that. He's trying to block the shot, Copes. He, he, By coming from back here trying to block a shot? Well, correct. And when you've got this uh, elite, uber elite athlete going and up you to think, dunk it, you, you think know he you didn't know to... that? You think he didn't know that? But yeah, I'm saying he came up there, he tried to block the shot. The intent wasn't to hurt him. Unfortunately, an accident. He's paid a price. He gets a, 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 a suspension. Get him out of here. But, <laughs> but, but I think that uh, he's an important part of what they do too, Dylan Brooks. But... Uh, Ja Morant, we, we, we've glazed over that. That guy has just been extraordinary for this. What would he be, 6'4"? I read he's only like 80 kilo yeah. in the 70s, yeah. the kilo, but just so explosive, so spectacular, and that, that 47 points was With something With one special. good eye. He had mm. blurred vision for, I think, most of the second half. It's incredible. Just back on that Dylan Brooks incident, mm. this is what the Warriors coach Steve Kerr had to say. I don't know if it was intentional, but it, it, it was dirty and... Um, <clears throat> You know, playoff basketball is going to, it's supposed to be physical. You know, everybody's going to compete. Everybody's going to fight for everything. But there's a code in this league. There's a code that players follow um, where you, you never put a guy's season slash career in jeopardy by taking somebody out in midair and clubbing them across the head and ultimately fracturing Gary's elbow. When you're trying to block a shot from behind, mm. yeah, maybe maybe you tip the top of his head. I've been there. Mm. You don't take a guy's head off that's flying in the air. You think they yeah. didn't know what they were doing? Well, but like I said, that that is a super elite athlete, and you know it. He 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 can rise above like uh, 
the absolute very best in the NBA. So you know you've got to come strong. And, and yeah, he did hit him. I don't know if he... Well, well it's a one-game suspension anyway. So game three, no Dylan Brooks. The Phoenix Suns, let's talk about them. They have the upper hand at the moment in the series against the Mavs. Two and oh. And Chris Paul, I mean, it was so tight in game two. And then he put on an absolute show in the fourth. He scored about half of his 28 points in the final quarter to get the Suns over the line. And Copes, he's just days away from turning 37, is Chris Paul. So you tell me that the Suns get some mention on this show? We've been talking about... Uh, the Lakers all year long, and I've been bringing up the Suns. They playing fantastic basketball. It's time for Chris Paul to win a championship, you know. And, and as you see, he's a veteran on this team, but he's a leader. And when he's around, the rest of the team follows. And the big thing is he's stepping up in big moments. In those last quarters is when it's like, all right, you've had your fun. Now it's time for the veterans to take charge and get things done. And he's doing it really efficiently. He runs the team super well, but it's his scoring as well in the last quarters that's really sticking out. And what about Luka Doncic? He, he has been fantastic. 35 in game two. Yep. 47, I think, or thereabouts. 45, I think 45 it was. 80 in, he's had across the two games. Yeah, incredible numbers that he's putting up. Uh, but, but not enough. And you do, in this series, and I know home court can mean a lot, they do seem to have an advantage mm -hmm. over, over the Mavs. Yeah, I think uh, a couple of others probably need to step up. Over in the East, well, is it a case of uh, no Joel Embiid, no 76ers? Yeah. Because the Heat uh, have taken a 2-0 lead and it looks like the 76ers are imploding, Copes. Now we see how important uh, Embiid is. We talked about him being the MVP the whole year. Now you take him out of this team and they're crumbling. Mm. Uh, and, and again, they spoke about Doc Rivers being around and he's not worried about his job. But Harden needs to pick his game up. If he doesn't, this, this series is over. He's getting more attention, though, is James Harden. Well, he is. And, and you know what? You, you watch these games and you watch James Harden and where he used to be able to explode to the rim and draw those fouls, you don't see it as much. And it's almost... Like, he's lost a step of pace. And, you know, without Joel Embiid, it's, it's hard to see how they're going to get back into this. But, you know, home court can, is, is huge in Philly. The fans there are as crazy as anywhere in the competition. So, um, you know, maybe things change. But, but the, the heat... We, you, you talk a, uh, about what Phoenix and how they might have gone under the radar mm. a, a little bit as well. Uh, heat just quietly yeah. going about their business and getting the job done. Yeah. They certainly are, and Doc Rivers said that there's no guarantee that Joel Embiid will be back for Game 3. No so. Embiid, they're done. Oh dear, watch this space. Still plenty more to come on the jump. NBL Commissioner Jeremy Laliga to join us, as well as Aussie legend and Sydney Kings owner Andrew Bogut. Stick around. I had a vision that this would happen someday. Uh, definitely didn't expect it to happen this quickly. We were rocked up in pre-season and no one knew who we were. At the start it was interesting because they didn't know what to uh, believe, but then um, as the season went on they continued to be behind us and, um, and it's just been incredible. It's been an incredible year here. Now when we go to Woolworths, people are wearing Jack Jumpers gear and celebrating the club and obviously we're in the grand final chasing, chasing the title. Uh, you know, the underdog scenario is a, it's a nice story, but uh, to me, the story is just about a group of guys that have believed in a, a bigger purpose than themselves. Being a part of something that's brand new and building that culture and being a part of the culture because at the end of the day, whatever happened this year, like we're, our names are going to be in history books for the first team. Our team's very unselfish. Uh, they care about each other. We talk about things that most probably locker rooms don't. We talk about loving each other, being around each other. But now what we're doing, continuing to make the page longer in the history books for ourselves as the first year has been amazing. People keep saying, like, we got nothing to lose, we got nothing to lose, but there's a lot, like, game three, that was a grand final to lose. And now, not many guys get chances to win a championship, so we've got as much to lose as they do. Would you say the identity of this team is, is what you envision? Absolutely. And what is that? Nasty, tough, never give up, fighters. I constantly remind myself, like, my parents will love me no matter what I do out there. My dog will love me and <laughs> will want pats no matter what happens. Once the jump ball goes off, that's, um, I'm at peace out there. The home game last week was crazy. Um, it was uh, like the loudest thing ever. Sunday's gonna be epic. Uh, that was a big motivator for us going into game three. We're like, we, we, we need to play in front of those fans. It's like a dome, so it's like, you know what I mean? Everybody's like 
right there and you can just feel the energy and feel the place rocking. We want to see if they can tear that place down and we get that win that second game. What do you think Sunday will be like there? Oh my god, it'll be even worse. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it'll be even worse. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, honestly. The place might catch on fire. I don't know. It'd be amazing. What's keeping you up at night about Sydney? Nothing. Yeah, it'll just be a dogfight. I feel like what we enjoy, as our, our team does, is going to be a dogfight. We're going to go out there and play as hard as possible. And I, we know that they will. Um, they smacked us in the mouth the last time we played them. Sydney's got a heck of a team. They're a fantastic, talented team. But I'm not staying up at night worrying about Sydney. Well, what an incredible story the Jack Jumpers are. They are the most talked about team at the moment in the Australian sporting landscape. A fantastic success story and probably something that none of us saw no, coming, gents. No, absolutely not. I, I don't think anyone in their right mind had gave the Tasmanian Jack Jumpers any chance at all to even make the playoffs. Let me the make the playoffs. I had them in last place. Let's just yeah. be honest. Yeah. You know? And you look at their team and, and it's astounding. Some of the times you... You look out on the floor and you go, oh, that's a pretty solid NBL one team. And here they are in the championship series. Wow. It's uh, quite extraordinary. And they, Scott Roth, I, as we've been banging yeah. on about mm -hmm. the entire season, <laughs> he needs to take a lot of credit for what's going on. Now, he's built an incredible team environment for the Tassie Jack Jumpers. Well, we are lucky enough to be joined tonight by NBL Commissioner Jeremy Laliga. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us on The Jump. Welcome. Oh, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here on the eve of uh, such an auspicious occasion. Oh, we are so excited about Game 1 kicking off tonight. But when you first gave Tassie that licence, did you expect in your wildest dreams that we would be sitting here right at this moment talking about them going into a grand final Be honest, series? Jeremy. Be honest now. <laughs> Come on. I, I, I would love to say yes. I would love to say yes. But no, I, I think uh, as Gazy and Coates alluded to earlier, I don't think anyone in their wildest dreams envisaged that well, let's not just say Tassie, let's say an expansion franchise would make it into the finals in their first year of competition. Um, I mean, South East Melbourne Phoenix had a pretty solid lineup in their first year of the competition. Mm. Uh, they gave it a red hot go, but they didn't make the finals. Um, they did in their second season. Uh, you, you've got the, um, as Gazy said, on paper, a lineup <laughs> that doesn't look like it should be competitive against mm. the likes of Melbourne United, Sydney Kings, Perth Wildcats, and yet, pretty much after round six or seven, showed that they were the equal of, of any team in the competition. And uh, now that we've seen it, and we've seen it there with Tasmania and, and what can be done in a, in a very, very short period of time, does this uh, inspire the league to look elsewhere yeah. and, and consider expansion? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tasmania has become the blueprint for a successful sporting franchise, put aside basketball, but it's proven that regional teams can work, that there is a place for... Um, professional representation in places that have been previously underrepresented. That was part of the rationale for introducing the Jack Jumpers in the first place, was we felt that to be a, a truly national competition, we had to be in some of those underrepresented markets, that the people of Tasmania deserved a professional sporting team to call their own. And um, there are certainly other places around the country who are putting their hand up and asking the question. And we take the same approach that we always have, which is that we won't grow for the sake of growth. All of the right factors have to be there. That is the infrastructure, the public interest, government support, local corporate support. All of those things were there in Tasmania and that's why it's been such a success. It's not a mystery. Um, and so we will go cautiously forwards and engage in those conversations around the country. We're not going to rush into anything, but certainly we won't rule anything out. Do you have a goal in mind in terms of what you ultimately would like this competition to look like in terms of the number of teams? No, I think it has to grow relative to the growth of the popularity of the sport. Um, I mean, there were times when there were 16 teams in the NBL. I don't know if it ever got higher than that. Daisy Copes, I might defer to you, but there were certainly 16 teams. Yeah, 16. Teams. Yeah. And at the time, the market could bear that because, um, you know, the, the sporting landscape was not quite as cluttered as, and congested as it is now. You have to keep monitoring the market as other codes rise and fall, and we do the same. Um, you know, you, you look at the, the case for growth at any particular point in time. So I won't put a definitive number on it. I think you need to reflect what's happening around you. Jeremy, because New Zealand did such a great job over the last two years by being on the road, any plans on giving them a break next year? <laughs> yeah, it's been flagged in a number of different conversations as to what we could do to try and 
well, let's call Spade Spade, make it up to the breakers and make it up to their fans. Their fans haven't had any basketball, live basketball, for two years, with the exception of some some games at the very end of the season of that first COVID-affected year. Um, so both for the breakers organization, but for their loyal fans as well, we'd love to do something. We don't yet know what that looks like, but you have to do it in a way that is still fair and equitable. You don't want to compromise the integrity of the competition, but we are exploring ways that we can, we can do something to give back and say thanks. Hey, Jeremy, what, uh, I know there's been a bunch of surveys done. Uh, News Limit, I think, put out a, a survey. But one of the, the um, issues that I think most of the guys from the bygone era would like to see is a return to the 48-minute game. And it, I just get a sense from the league that they're a little lukewarm on, on that. Is that because of TV? or is it, What's the explanation behind um, what I don't feel is a, a real serious look at, at changing the time frames of the games? Yeah, we, we had a real serious look at it. Mm. Um, to be perfectly honest, there was one cohort that was very in favour of it, and I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, Gazy, but it was uh, some of the folks that you referred to then, some of the old heads of the game. <laughs> but um, And that's perfectly understandable, wanting to hark back to the time when it was a 48-minute league as well and, and wanting to be compared like for like with the NBA. By the same token, the vast majority of fans were very keen on a 40-minute game. Um, certainly, it fits well into broadcast, into a two-hour window, but a lot of the feedback that we get from uh, our audience, both in attendance and uh, viewership, is that it's really well family-oriented viewing and that the NBA can drag on for far too long to be able to watch a whole game. Speaking of the NBA, is there any plans on making trades throughout the season? I know it's probably harder for the NBA to do that, but have you guys talked about that at all? Love to make some trades between the NBL and the yeah. NBA during the season, <laughs> if that's what you mean. But no one... Uh, an NBL trade window. Yes. Uh, again, it's certainly something that's been discussed and we would love to introduce it. Um, and I certainly wouldn't rule it out as, as to when we might do that. Um, there is a lack of liquidity that the NBA doesn't have a problem with. So they've got 30 teams, 15 players per roster. That makes it a really interesting conversation when you open up a trade window. With 10 teams, you know, 12, 13 players per roster, there's far less movement going to happen just by nature of, of the limited number of people. So just query how interesting it would be if you have one or two trades. It would be um, fun, though. It would be fun. It'd be, it would make some noise. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Um, on the NBA draft that's upcoming in June, obviously there's some NBL players who have been looked at and on the draft radar. The rest of the world is clearly taking notice of our league here. What kind of impact does that have? Yeah, it's been absolutely huge. I mean, uh, I, I've been very fortunate in that in non-COVID years, I get to go uh, and see a lot of basketball content and people all around the world. And I can't tell you how much the dialogue has changed over the course of the past two or three years. Everyone you speak to in world basketball now knows about the NBL, knows that we're churning out folks who are going to be first round lottery picks um, and that are going to be stars of the future. Whereas before you had to go and, and give the elevator pitch every time you met someone new. Um, so it's had exactly the, inc uh, the impact that we were hoping that it would have. Um, it's something that we need to continue working on very hard because sometimes you're a victim of your own success and as a result of the success of the Next Stars program, there are all kinds of competitive programs popping up around the yep. world and that's great. Competition is a wonderful thing and it will help us continue to strive and get better. Well, Jeremy, it's been a fantastic season so far and we're really excited about what the future of the NBL looks like. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on The Jump. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Jeremy LaLiga there, the NBL Commissioner. Still plenty more to come on The Jump. Stay with us. Next up, it's our Basketball Insider from ESPN.com.au. Kane Pittman with all the latest news. Stick around. Foul. Points will count. Right, that's more like it. Well, oh, nice skills. Dancing down low, coming up with a finish. McIntosh. It was hard at first to adjust, and obviously every system you go to, it's like I change teams every year. It's hard to adjust to the system everywhere you go. Uh, but I think this was the hardest one, just for the defensive prowess, uh, the, the pressure that we had to put on, um, the, the kind of the, the offensive, defensive 
load that we had on each other and stuff like that, and especially for new guys that didn't know anything. It was kind of hard to find your niche in that team. My job was either to make him uncomfortable or make them very comfortable. And he was a guy that I made very uncomfortable. And I wanted to test him to make sure that he was really all in. And you know, the outside things were chirping, but for me, I think it would have set a really poor precedent for us to cut someone in our first year when all I've been saying is culture, culture, culture. And then in two or three months, it's not good enough. Let's get another player. I don't mind changing players, and you have to make those decisions at some point. This wasn't the year to give up on somebody that I still had a lot of belief in. This is the guy that can take the ball off the dribble and finish beautiful left hand off the glass. I think at a certain point, I just decided to play my game. And if it worked, it worked. And if it didn't, then I would have been happy with the results. And, and uh, the results end up being what it is now. And if it was what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is, I'll just go out there and play my game and, and play for my teammates and do whatever it is. And I've never been known to be a selfish player on the court, so it wasn't really that hard to, you know, I mean, share the wealth kind of thing. Yeah, he's been awesome. Me and him have had some epic battles in practice. I can tell you that uh, he's made me better and I've made him better. And then throughout the year, he's found his spots to attack. And when he's getting downhill, playing one-on-one, he's, he's hard to guard, he's a handful. He's one of the strongest guys pick up full court and when he's hitting that shot he's uh he's a, he's a handful he's tough to guard McIntosh will have to step back it goes <laughs> so many great stories in this Jack Jumpers outfit and Mikhail McIntosh is one of those struggled at the start of the season but looks like a completely different player now he's oozing confidence and having an impact when it matters most to talk more about him and, of course, the Jack Jumpers, let's bring in our ESPN.com.au basketball insider, Kane Pittman. Kane, welcome to you. Yeah, good to be here. Quick little trip down to Tassie. Beautiful place, by the way. Uh, Is it cold? Uh, freezing cold. <laughs> Absolutely freezing cold, I'll say that. But uh, great scenery, great food, lots of spots if you want to get a beverage. We didn't, only work. Only work for us, no time for that, but uh, what a spot. And a great interview there with Mikhail McIntosh. I love what Scott Roth said as well about making him uncomfortable because sometimes being comfortable with uncomfortableness is uh, something that pushes you out of your boundaries. Yeah, and it worked out. And I think that's the, the big story here. He knew he had a bunch of guys that he would have to coach differently. And that's how you, certainly with a modern team, that's the approach you have to have. Uh, the thing I loved about Mikhail McIntosh is that he really opened up about the fact that he was feeling significant pressure because he was an import. He's coming to a new team. He wanted to be a guy that was really contributing and he understood that he wasn't and he was trying to find his spot in this team and he, he really said that it was a big struggle for him. And, and coach, I guess you would be a good person to ask. I mean, not everyone can come in and have a 10 plus year career in the NBL as a star import, but you would have played alongside guys that would have felt that pressure and the struggle to come into a new country and, uh, and contribute straight away. Absolutely, and he was struggling very early, like you said, but there's no, no doubt, no doubt as an import, you have to come in. You want to come in and, and put, make a statement and say, look, I can play this game. And then bringing him off the bench too, he would have been going home worrying about his job. Mm -hmm. And I called it early. I said, look, he's he got a plane ticket coming straight away. But I'm just happy to see that he's found his feet and he's playing good well, You know what they did do is they figured out how to use him. Because mm. at the start, you know, on the box, but they found probably about from the halfway point about putting him on those elbows and letting him rip. Yeah. Letting him go, and you saw it in those highlights there. Early on, the floor was congested and they didn't, the spacing wasn't quite right for him. But once they found out how to utilise his skills and... Uh, you know, talking about coming in and making a statement, uh, Leonard Copeland, as we went through the data, 23 shots a game you were taking in year one. So you <laughs> wanted to really They didn't bring it. me here now, to pass the ball. They brought me here to put it up. <laughs> but, that, but that's what happened. And McIntosh comes in and he's probably thinking the same. i got to get my shots up. And once you figure out your role and, mm -hmm. that, and when the coach shows some confidence with you, because despite everything, he would have heard the chitter-chatter from lose guys confidence, like Copes. But you lose confidence as well if you're not doing something. If you're not scoring, if you're not rebounding, you're going to lose confidence in yourself. He said he was in his own head way too That's much. Right. That's what he said. He opened up about that. Uh, one other interesting thing, just quickly, the Will Magne injury, Mikhail McIntosh has actually spent a fair bit of time at the five. He's playing undersized. And he said a while ago, someone said to him, you should be looking to be like PJ Tucker, who has had an incredible NBA career as an undersized big. Mm. And he said his first reaction is, why would I want to be like PJ Tucker? That's not the role I want to aspire to. And uh, the person that was talking to him said, you know what? He's made a hell of a lot of money. You could do that. And he's playing that role. That's yeah. right. 
all the talk. Josh Adams, Jalen Adams, the two Adams. But Josh Adams has been such a great spark, hasn't he, for Tassie as well? He has, and 21 points in the second half, Nat. You're well aware of what he did in game I've three. I've it from my memory. Uh, but, one, <laughs> but one thing that was really interesting was at halftime, and where uh, I was sitting at this game very close to the, to the Melbourne United bench, and the players come off for their uh, post uh, halftime interview. Mm. And just before halftime, Josh Adams was uh, losing the plot. He was very emotional. He was. he was out of control. And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't know if this is the right guy to interview. And I asked Scott Roth about that. And he said that he was walking down the stairs to the locker room and Will Magne came up to him and said, gee, I think they got the wrong guy for this interview here. But uh, he said uh, he got great encouragement from the coaching staff at halftime. They calmed him right down and he had that huge second half. And Scott Roth admitted at times his emotions can go over the edge, uh, but he's that type of player. Well, it was on the balance because if you remember the start of that third quarter, he came out and shot it. I think he had the first four or five yeah. shots of, of the quarter. Yeah. So that whether he channeled that yeah, energy on a mission. To, to, to put the game in his hands and it, it paid out in, in the end because uh, without those points and uh, that big, big, big game-breaker yes. shot off the dribble in that right-hand corner fading away that really decided the game uh, can only come about when you've developed that confidence. You've seen the ball go through the through the rim, and uh, good things are, were are going right, his man? way. Oh, I, was, I was a fly running around, oh. and I didn't just get it away from Daisy there. I no. appreciate it. I thought it might have been your giant ego. When oh, you wow. Swatting away. Um, from one Adams to another, Jalen Adams, he's the one we always talk about when we think about the Sydney Kings, but are we forgetting Xavier Cooks? A little bit. My and, guy. My yeah, guy he, cool. he has had an incredible season and uh, caught up with him during the week as well. And one thing that he said, because I asked the question, I said, you could have played overseas. You've had, been, had a successful career overseas. Why did you come back to the Kings? And he basically said, look, they gave me this two-year contract and I felt like I owed them. I wasn't out on the court. They paid me significant money and I wanted to pay them back and win a championship with this franchise. And he said that the interesting thing about this season is that he doesn't believe that he's ever got this much credit, this, this many plaudits from the general public. Because a lot of people in Australia didn't know what this man was capable of because they haven't seen it. So I just think it's been an awesome story to see him, one of the best two-way players in the league. Uh, and he said himself, you know, maybe I was a little bit snubbed from that first All-NBL team. And I, I think he might have a case. I had him, I had him as MVP, man, because what he brings is something different. I had of him the on the entire board. league. I had him for the... <laughs> no, no, not for the entire league. Right. For the Sydney Kings. Right, okay. But listen... I then I so had him on the Boomers. Is the league. That is the league because Jalen Adams. Well, anyway, I had him on the Boomers <laughs> team as well, and you said he's not good enough. I don't know, coach. Is what are you? I've never he, said that. Go back and get tape. I don't I've know, coach. Never... I don't know if he's good enough. That is the most. Now he's in the grand final. He's doing his thing. Give the man some praise. All of a sudden, coach is gaslighting us all <laughs> and just making just outrageous. Outrageous comments. Well, well, coming no, no, I, I love Xavier Cooks, and the thing, and we all both remember his dad. We yep. played against his dad. Who's and, better? Who's and better? the similarities better? between yeah. him and his dad are, are extraordinary. Yep. Yep. Dante Exum, he's been playing in Barcelona at the moment, but an untimely injury during the uh, Europe League finals. Well, it's a massive shame because we've been talking about Dante Exum and the excellent run he's had right from the Olympics through to uh, signing with Barcelona and the healthy run that he's had. He suffered a left adductor strain right at the worst time so the Euro League Final Four is coming up it starts on May 20 so they're basically uh, unsure of his availability for the whole tournament he'll probably miss the first game here but they're not ruling him out for the entire season but this really has been the story of Dante Exum's career every time he looks like he's about to really get it rolling something uh, untimely like this and this isn't a major injury that's the positive but just frustrating. And, and the frustrating thing for him, if he has aspirations of getting back into the NBA, this is the, the only thing stopping right, him. It's, yeah. it's that uh, lack of confidence they have in, in the guy's body. And th hopefully this is just a minor one because he has had a decent run. And what a couple of games we saw in, in to, uh, for the two teams to get there, particularly with uh, that Barcelona and the Olympiacos game as well to get to the... To the um, with, in the European competitions, the way in which the fans get around it. But uh, let's hope Dante uh, can get through and get back on the floor. And Kane, before we let you go, an update on Ben Simmons because if anyone thought that he was faking it and it wasn't a legit back injury, he's having surgery or he's already had surgery. Yeah, he had major surgery in uh, Los Angeles this morning. So this is going to be a three to four month 
recovery. This is a micro disectomy that he's had here, and we know that he had the. Okay, okay, settle, settle down. Okay, settle down. That's a D, not a V, isn't it? Desectomy? <laughs> yeah. Just settle down here, Gabe. <laughs> but uh, he is going to be recovering for the next three weeks, and then he'll be able to get stuck into uh, the rehab. I did wonder whether I should say that if we will be able to control ourselves at this area of the desk. We're Obviously very not. mature and professional. But the days were no more about the dussectomy or bussectomy <laughs> than we were. I don't know. Well, that's the expert of epidurals. And so everyone has something that they're, you know, <laughs> common with. No, I thought he was at a stage of life where uh, he, he still looked at... OK, this, this is hey, getting way, way off this track. This is a basketball show. It's wholesome <laughs> family goodness. Kane, thank you uh, so much for joining us. As always, we love your work. Enjoy the grand final series. We will do. See you next week. Good work. Kane. All right, still more to come on the jump. Aussie legend and Sydney Kings owner Andrew Bogut to join us on the other side of this break. <laughs> Stats it down with all piece of work by the superstar. Adnan Bogut oh rejects it to Bogut on the move. Yes. Big Bogut says, I'll meet you, Miles Plumley. Brooker is in two in a row. Seven points for him. The twirling Dantich. Melting into the defense. The puck there. He got it in a foul. Wow. It ain't right, Kevin. He's got the last nine for the man. But look at look at all the moves right here. I'm gonna count them out for you. Right. I'm gonna count them out for you. There's one. Okay, you wanna dance? Watch a little Kevin McHale shuffle, and then okay, I'll come right back into your body. There was about four moves there by Luca. Doncic has a playoff average of 33.4. Luka Doncic, the absolute superstar, doing it all there for the Mavs, but he's going to need a little bit of help from his teammates if they're going to steal a game from the Suns. Well, it is. And uh, did you see Stephen A. Smith talking about, well, maybe they're uh, going at him and uh, that maybe they've, they've found him out in game yeah. two. The man had 35 <laughs> and was uh, <laughs> almost 60 He reminds me of you. Plays on the offensive end, <laughs> but on the defensive no end, we're going to target you every <laughs> time, bro. Hey, Play well, some defense. <laughs> Come on, man. No, no, but they did... They did seem to isolate him. And in the post-game press conference, they were asking Chris Paul about it, and he had a bit of a smirk about it. So clearly, they're, uh, they're looking at they him, go after him. They trying go to after. exploit him on the defensive end. And why wouldn't you? Mm. Um, all right. Before I welcome in our very next guest, I want to play something because it is Andrew Bogue. We'll get to him in just a second. But there was a, a little segment on his Rogue Bogues oh. podcast that we were alerted to during the week. Take a listen. NBL Commentator of the Year, I am going with Leonard Copeland. He's himself, he brings humour, doesn't fence it, calls it as he sees it, um, has some hilarious one-liners. Um, this is the first year they've had him on a regular basis and I think he has been fantastic, a breath of fresh air there. Um, I know a lot of people have really enjoyed kind of his, his back and forth. Um, he played with Andrew Gaze, he was his main import back in the day and they have a really good relationship. So they, you know, he gets on Gaze a bit for sitting on the fence. <laughs> Just really fun to listen to. I think he's the commentator of the year, in my opinion. Come on, here's two things. Two things. Firstly, Copes demanded that be played. He okay, put it that's in our He came in and he said, "We're playing this." Secondly, wow, Bugs, he did. He, he, has Copes got photos of you in compromising positions or, or something? <laughs> what is going what on? Is going on no, there? Don't worry about you. I'm too close to you. I'm starting to sit on the fence. i got to go back to my old way. <laughs> You're right, Morgan. You're exactly right. Andrew, yeah. welcome <laughs> into you. Welcome to the jump. We will get to that. What 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 possessed you? He does not have hilarious wow. one-liners. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, he does. He does. He toes the line. He's kind of like me. You know, he's on that, on that line of... <laughs> Inappropriateness sometimes. <laughs> you want to get too love it. We need that. We need that personalities. Great. You know, we can't have Gazy. That, that fence is getting very, <laughs> very Bugs, broken. I, come on, man. <laughs> just because I see that there might be a different point of view. Oh, I'm You're just on both sides. You don't want to hurt I'm not on both sides. Hurt somebody's feelings sometimes. Feel like sometime. you, <laughs> well, that? Ask if there's a different point of view. Give yours. <laughs> yeah. That's right. No, well, I, do, I probably do. Perhaps not as... as Forthright as you might express yours, but uh, try to try to add something. You're sitting on the fence again, Drew. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> always, always, and it's never going to change. Hey, Andrew, it's great to have you yes. on the jump. Obviously, one of the Sydney Kings owners. I mean, all the talk has been about the Jack Jumpers this week. Does that kind of suit the Kings? Look, they've had a fantastic season. We can't we can't put that um, to bed. You know, they 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 deserve to be there. They they beat a very tough Melbourne United team. And 
where I'm concerned in a way because I'm getting text messages and, and calls, <laughs> emails this week saying, congrats on winning the grand final. <laughs> oh, no. And, honestly, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, <laughs> no, we're not there yet. Anything can happen. Injuries could come into play, you know, as we see in the NBA now, the suspensions, all that kind of stuff. And this is a very, very tough team. This, this Jack Jumpers team is not going to beat themselves. We need to beat them. And if we, look, if we come out and play like we did in the first half of game two, where we turn the ball over 10 times, they're going to they're gonna have a chance because they grind out long possessions. Our style is shoot the first good available shot. Their style is run our shot clock down as much as we can and get a good shot at the end of it. So they like playing less possessions. So I'm, I'm weary of, of how hard they play and I definitely respect them. It is. And uh, when we look back at the, the season you guys have had too, it was a little shaky at the start when Jalen wasn't there and, um, you know, still trying to figure out uh, your, your roster. Uh, big move came when you, you, that you guys signed Ian Clark. Now, uh, I, I, we all just assumed that was uh, your doing. Is, is, <laughs> was, did you have your hands all over Ian Clark and was he, through your contacts, was he able to come here because he's a quality player? Well, yeah, I was a part of it, but Chris Pongrass deserves a lot of that credit. Um, you, you know, the thing that people don't understand when we signed Ian Clark, everyone said, oh, the Kings are overspending again and, and all that. Let me give you a tip. We're not paying a standard luxury tax this year, just to put it out there for everybody. Um, <laughs> we're not over the cap, believe it or not. Uh, we're happy to post our numbers if, if we could <laughs> be our rules. But Ian Clark hadn't played basketball for about a year. Mm. So... There was a bit of a risk with what we were doing and we just went through that with RJ Hunter. He hadn't played basketball in a while. We brought him in and, you know, to, to not be disrespectful to him, but he was he was kind of undercooked. His body just wasn't ready to play professional basketball again and he got hurt and did his knee and he left and it ended up being a, a blessing in disguise for us, not good for him. But then we had that same risk with Ian um, and that's why we could fit him in salary-wise because... You know, we couldn't take the risk and overpay and go over the cap for a guy that um, that hadn't played in a year. But I knew what Ian would bring um, on the court. But what a lot of people don't know is what he's brought off the court for us. He's been a huge stable force for us in the locker room. He's a no-nonsense veteran. Um, you know, before the game, he's staring into oblivion like he's ready to, to kill somebody. <laughs> he's got that attitude. And I think he's, honestly, he's been huge for us um, off the court as much as on. It's been, it's been a godsend to get him. Morgan, no doubt you guys have the best, I mean, the best imports in the league. What's the plans on re-signing them? Because if you don't re-sign them, somebody else, <laughs> Melvin, get 90, or somebody, <laughs> is going to try to grab one of them. Well, that, that's the challenge that we have. We, we, we obviously want to keep this team together as, as long as we can. Getting to the grand final is not easy, as everyone knows, and then trying to win it is a whole other thing. But... That's what happens when you're successful. When you're successful, other teams will try to poach your players and, and know that you're kind of strung out with your salary cap. And we're also competing with, with the NBA and EuroLeague. And we know that some EuroLeague teams have had their eyes on our league now. Um, and then there's the NBA thing. So hopefully we can keep him. We, we know Chase Buford was, was in Jalen's ear to get him over here in the first place. He wasn't really entertaining the NBL until we, we signed Chase Buford and, and he got in his ear a little bit to get him over here. Um, and Ian Clark's obviously trying to play his way back in the NBA so he could be back there. But if they're available to stay in the NBL, we, we'd think that we'd open the checkbook up. Hey, now, we're going to test how how, uh, how Boga, you know, he talks about being off the fence. But uh, oh. <laughs> we saw a couple of weeks ago uh, both your players and your coaches get involved uh, with the officials and made some comments to you about the officials. And one of them was uh, uh, Chris Reed. Uh, he has been now appointed to the grand final series as part of that uh, referee uh, team. Uh, how does how does that sit with you guys at, at, at the Sydney Kings? I'm fine with it. Um, look, Chase Chase made a huge mistake um, in that last game of the season. Xavier as well to an extent, but what Chase did was unacceptable. We've, we've told him that, and I've told him that. He knows that. He took his medicine, and as as an owner and an ally of Chase Buford, I, I say, you know, he deserves that fine. Mm. Simple as that. So I think that might be one of the largest fines in NBL history. But it was way, a big I've one. Seen. I haven't seen, I haven't seen, you guys need to do some research, but I think $10,000 no. fine, I haven't, I haven't no. seen that before. So, mm. and, and look, he deserves it. Um, mm. He's accepted it, accepted his medicine, he's moving on. So how's that for sitting on the fence? Now we've seen that Luke Longley has been doing some work with the Kings. Just talk about the impact that he's had on the group. Yeah, he's been really good. Um, he just brings a different, uh, 
I guess, four process, then kind of me, then, then Paul Smith, then Chris Pongrass, you know, uh, Luke's kind of the, the, the feng shui of the group, the yoga <laughs> manager and the uh, chakra and all that kind of stuff. Whereas I'm like, I'm, I'm ready to kill and Paul Smith's you know, a vibrant personality and then Chris is a bit more quiet. So I don't know if you saw that article a week or so ago where Luke Longley said we're, we're, we're a bunch of misfits um, that yeah. have all come together and created something successful. And I believe there's some truth in that. I think, you know, for for successful businesses, for teams, you can't have all the same personalities. And we agree to disagree a lot. You, sh you, should, you should have heard our, Drew, you said uh, our, our start of, of three and eight or whatever we were, or three and six. You should have heard our board calls, uh, those, those weeks. <laughs> Oof. We had, we had board calls that we, we're doing once a week and just go over injuries and the team and how things are tracking. They're usually, you know, 30 to 40 minutes. Some of these calls were three hours. So wow. <laughs> it was, wasn't a fun time to be a king at that point. Wow. Morgan, now speaking of Paul Smith, we got a taste of him, just a little bit of taste when we were up there. He's, he wears his heart on his sleeves. There was a video going around of him dancing and giving a rap song. <laughs> Any chance of you doing that? Yeah, we win, a grand, we win a grand final. Can we get you in the middle doing a rap song and a dance? Are you talking about the post game song? Yes, yes. He does that after every win. So wow. he, um, yeah, the Ric Flair and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, he's. Uh, <laughs> I love it, man. Like people, he's not everyone's cup of tea, but we, we need more owners and more vibrant personalities in our league. I'm all for an owner that is in there and you should see him after losses. Like it's like someone shot his dog, honestly. And, and, and you want that. You want, no, you want a passionate owner that cares. We don't want owners in this league that buy this a team as a passive investment. They're not around. The players don't, you know, touch and feel and be around them and have conversations with them. He's around win or loss. And after the games, he gets the cooler or the esky out. That's his drum. He's in the locker room and, and he leads the guys through a song. And um, the guys really appreciate it. He, he really he really does wear his heart yeah. on his sleeve. Not everyone's cup of tea, but I think um, most of the players realise that he's in this with them as much as they are. And uh, despite uh, Copes trying to get Chase Buford fired earlier. <laughs> wow, <laughs> come on, man. man that's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> you got to win in Sydney, man. They don't mess around. Up there. You got to win in Sydney. They don't mess around. Up there. I heard it all, Copes. Hey. I heard it all, Copes. <laughs> well, just... I got you guys on track. Because he's got pressure. He said there was a little bit of pressure, but you got on track. Well, despite that, he's, um, you know, he's still a, a relatively young, well, not a relative. He is a very... Yeah. Young man and, and uh, coming through the, the ranks, uh, obviously with his father RC, with the connection there uh, with the Spurs, uh, he's been impressive in the way in which, after a tough start to get the team back on track, uh, we saw Will Weaver only lasted uh, a season. What about his long term future with the Kings? Well, the good news is we learned our lesson with the Will Weaver thing. We've got a minimum, of, he's here a minimum of two years. Um, and an option on the third. So he'll be around next season again. And look, it's, it's tough. When you like I said, when you're successful, you're lauded. You lose mm. players. Um, Jay Sean Tate's a prime example. Didi Lazada, Will Weaver. We, 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 don't, we don't discourage it, um, but we understand that we're, we're trying to build something here long term. So we, we also can't afford to have a, co a new coach every year, right? Um, but it is, it is a tough task. We, we, we support being you know, a transitionary club or NBL club that, that, that says, hey, if you've got an NBA dream and you've got an offer, we don't want to hinder that. Um, but at the same time, we've got to find that balance of not leaving our club out to dry and having to constantly make changes. Yeah. But um, Chase has been phenomenal for our group. The guys love him. Um, he's made mistakes along the way and he wears the mistakes and admits them like the referee thing but he's done a lot of positives that people don't talk about as well. Chase Buford has been fantastic for the competition and we're mostly glad that he just proved Cope's <laughs> wrong. wrong. That's right. Oh Andrew Bogut, thank you so much for joining us on The Jump. We look forward to more episodes and I'm sure Cope's will like a mm. few more shout outs on the Rogue Vogues <laughs> podcast but thanks yeah, so much bro. for joining us. Best of luck. Hey, good luck, folks. Good luck. Thank you. Appreciate it. Go Kings. Good. Well, the scene is set for a huge grand final series, of course. Game one not far away. Stay with us on the jump. Here's Adams. All alone. You know the result. Guarded by Jessup. Steps into the three. He's next level. Now they've won two straight. Sweep the Hawks and book their spot in the NBL 22 grand final series. Jet and McIntosh, little two-man game. Shot clock's at six, tough one from McVay. Wow, good. no. Josh Majet. Shot clock at ten. Adams the off balance. Oh, oh, oh. oh my goodness! Unbelievable! The game games. Tasmania in their debut season are off to the grand final. 
Time now for the Performance Player of the Week, brought to you by Musashi. And this week, it's Josh Adams. We talked about him before. He was incredible against United in Game 3, delivering when it mattered most. Oof, yeah, he, he was spectacular. And uh, if not for him, that I don't think they would be in this grand final series uh, based on his performance in that Game 3. But, uh, gee whiz, Jalen Adams got to be a bit stiff. He had 30 and 29 in the two games. But that's against... to be expected, though, because the, the City Kings are so good. This guy mm. has that, he has that, oof, you know, he has that arrogance about him. And he put that team on his back yep. and got him past the mighty Melbourne United. <laughs> Thanks for rubbing it in again. I thought we got through most of the show without reliving that horror of Game 3. But let's face it, Josh Adams, Jalen Adams, both born to shine on mm. the big stage. And Jalen Adams, his family will have a front row seat to the Jalen Adams show. Let's listen to what he had to say. They'll be here Friday, actually. Yeah, they fly in. Uh, my mom, my... Uh, my uh, my grandparents and my little brother and my girl flying, so it's gonna be lit Friday. What's that gonna mean for you to have them all here? It's gonna be lit. Ah, right, it's as simple as that. For me, it's gonna be lit, man. They ain't get a chance to catch the show in person this whole year, so you know I'm gonna play my heart out. And it's self-explanatory. It's the grand finals anyway, so you know whether they were here or whether they weren't, I was gonna turn up. But now they're here, so really gotta turn it up. Cassie, you're in trouble. Is that yeah. Well, <laughs> is it? Could it, could it, could it send nah, you over? Yeah. No. If family comes nah. way overseas to see you play, mm. you got to put on a show. What's like he says, lit means he's about to put on a show. No, I know I know what lit, but <laughs> is lit an abbreviation of a word? Is it lit? Get lit. Lit, as in... I'm about to fire up. Light up. Oh, okay, light good, 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 good. Oh, I'll teach you. I knew it meant. Get, I'll get up with the lingo. <laughs> get lit. All right, game time. We're just around the corner. you got to get to the commentary box. Hey, I'm lit. Quick tip, game one. Who wins? Uh, I think that... Um, Get off the fence. Sydney wins. I, thought, well, I already said when I was talking about... I think they're going to go 3-0. Three, three so, okay. mm. Sydney win. Mm. All right. Sydney for mine too. Let's get lit because game hey. one is about to start. Stay with us on ESPN. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us on The Jump. We'll see you next week. We're lit, Dad. We're lit. Don't worry about us.